Hello, welcome to Beat Create Games, and today I'm doing my first ever hardcore Nuzlocke. Nuzlocke's have become probably the most popular form of challenge earned by Pokemon players. The basic rules are simple, you can only catch your first encounter per route, and if a Pokemon faints, it's considered dead and can't be used anymore. The hardcore variant adds a few additional rules that make sure the focus remains on the challenge aspect by banning excessive grinding and some of the more overpowered mechanics in the main series games like healing items and, and the option to switch automatically every time you knock out one of your opponent's Pokemon. These additions, quickly summarized, are 1. No items in battle except held items and Pokeballs. 2. Your Pokemon can't overlevel the next gym leader's ace and must be boxed if they do so. And 3. You should play on set mode, not shift. An additional rule usually used in Nuzlocke is Dupes Claws and or Species Claws, which are technically slightly different rules. Basically, they mean that you can only catch one out of each evolutionary line of Pokemon. I found regular Nuzlocke's boring in the past, but the hardcore rule set seemed much more appealing to me, so I really wanted to do one. It was just something I never got around to doing. Now I've decided to just sit down and do it. So this is the story of my first ever hardcore Nuzlocke attempt. I decide I'm not brave enough to attempt this with Charmander, so I start with Squirtle and name it Shiggy, because I'm never going to pass up an opportunity to use the name Shiggy. There isn't a ton of variety along the early routes, so most of the early encounters aren't super interesting. We had a Pidgey, a Rattata, and a Weedle for the team, although I do get to be pleasantly surprised by finding a Mankey for my Route 23 encounter. I'd have loved to find Pikachu in Viridian Forest, but it's a 5% encounter rate, so it was a long shot at best. I made sure to pick up a few antidotes so that I don't take unnecessary damage to poison on the way through Viridian Forest. We don't even have to fight most of the trainers in here though, and we make it through with ease. Now, level cap or not, we all know how the first fight with Brock goes when you bring a Squirtle. He goes down in two attacks to Shiggy's mighty water gun, and I've got my first badge of the run already. I'm surprised at the number of optional trainers in Mount Moon, too. I'm able to speed through the tunnel until basically the very end. We're blessed by the powers of Lord Helix and make our way to Cerulean City where we have a rival fight to prepare for. By this time, we've welcomed Jimmy the Spearow, Bread the Zubat, Sombrero the Ekans, and, most excitingly, the Magikarp from the Route 4 Pokemon Center to our team. The idea of fighting Misty before Nugget Bridge briefly crosses my mind, but I don't really have a good Pokemon for her. I'm sure with its water resistance that our War Turtle could probably handle it, but doing Nugget Bridge opens up a few more encounters, so I go for that instead. We've got a fight here against our rival Kaz, and after we hit his Pidgeotto with a couple of water guns, Kaz hits us with a curveball as he switches out into Bulbasaur just a few turns into the battle. I switch in my own Pidgeotto and get hit by a Sleep Powder, but fortunately Bulbasaur doesn't go for Leech Seed and hits us with a Vine Whip for minimal damage instead. When we wake up, we take him out with a critical hit Gust. Figure my Pidgeotto is better than his already half-damaged Pidgeotto and stay in to hit it with a Quick Attack. It survives, but then a second Quick Attack brings it down. Turns out we also two-shot his Rattata with Quick Attacks, and that sets up the Pidgeotto sweep, as his Abra is completely harmless at this point, only knowing Teleport. We storm through the first few fights on Nugget Bridge, but we get to a girl with two level 16 Nidorans, and my brain fails me here. I completely forget that Nidorans no double kick. Annie Kang misses a Hyper Fang that probably wasn't going to KO anyway, and he's immediately in serious danger as double kick hits him for massive damage. I have to switch out, and expecting another double kick, I bring in Beedrill. But we're playing against a professional here, and she reads me like a book, nearly bringing Gamma down with a single peck. I decide to go to Old Reliable, our starter, Shiggy, and he helps us avert disaster, but it's definitely a bit of a wake-up call. The bridge goes smoothly from there, and with a shiny nugget in hand, it's time to grab those two encounters I came here for. As luck would have it, we find exactly what I wanted, an Oddish. This is the Pokemon for the Misty fight. Uh, Oops. Come on, Annie King, I only went for Tackle. Our next encounter is an Abra, which would actually be a pretty great find if we can catch it, but we only have one shot, and here's how that goes. All right, here goes. Stay in the ball, you. Come on, Abra. Perfect. Well, despite our luck here, proceeding through the house that Team Rocket robbed and defeating the Grunt here does open up encounters on Routes 5 and 6. This is another chance to get Oddish, so I decide to go for it. The Team Rocket member here is stronger than most of the trainers we've fought on the way, but nothing too difficult. He has a Machop, which is easily handled by Pidgeotto, so the only real danger is switching something into Drowsy. 
Piggy gets put to sleep on the switch, but he unsuccessfully spams disable against us while we bite him to death and retrieve the Dig TM. In addition to opening up these next two encounters, Dig is a great pickup for the surge fight ahead. Hopping down some ledges on Route 5, I find the chance for redemption, and learning from past mistakes, I throw a ball without risking any attack this time. Welcome to the team, Panda! Our encounter from Route 6 is a Meowth named Kid A, who goes straight into a box never to emerge. Thanks to Panda the Oddish, who conveniently evolves into a Gloom right at the level cap for Misty, we have another very smooth fight. Staryu can barely hurt Panda, and we just heal off whatever damage we take with Absorb. We do less damage to Starmie, and Misty has a super potion to use, but ultimately Gloom just completely walls it. It takes a while, but Misty has no chance, and we capture a second badge and make for Vermilion City. After a quick stop in Diglett's cave, we have Onion the Diglett on our side. I also bring out Sombrero, evolving it into an Arbok and teaching it Dig. Theoretically, that seems like it should be enough to handle the upcoming fight with Surge. Before we get there though, we gotta step on the boat and challenge our rival. Speedy's Intimidate renders Pidgeotto unable to do much damage, but unfortunately we only have Bite, and it's still a special attack in Gen 3, so it's a bit of a slog actually doing damage ourselves. We eventually bring Pidgeotto down and stay in to also take Raticate down, but Hyper Fang puts us in a somewhat dangerous range as Kadabra comes in. Here I think I let Kadabra get in my head a little bit. It's very fast and hits very hard, so I was kinda scared of it. I switch out to Shiggy. Shiggy gets hit by Kinesis, and I don't want to deal with that, so I switch out again to Pidgeotto. But Pidgeotto takes massive damage on the switch. I don't know if I one-shot with Quick Attack. Probably not, so I choose to switch once again. This is a mistake that proves fatal. Jimmy takes the confusion a lot better, but still sits in range of a critical hit knockout. I can't just keep switching though, so I decide to attack. Also, Pursuit is entirely the wrong move to go for here, I don't know why I did that, it was just a bad play. Kadabra gets the critical hit confusion, and my poor bird goes down. It's the first death of the run. Shiggy cleans up, and now we have to deal with Ivysaur. With Pidgeotto low on health and Firo dead, this is more of a problem than it should have been, but I bring Panda in and land a Sleep Powder. That gives me the free switch to Pidgeotto that I need, and we bring Ivysaur down with a couple of gusts. Rest in peace, Jimmy. You'll be missed. We teach Onion how to cut, and with this knowledge we Storm Surge's gym to go for our third badge. Onion's fast, which is good, because so is Voltorb, but we're able to outspeed it and take it down with a single dig. Pikachu goes down similarly, but Raichu presents probably the biggest threat of any single Pokemon we've fought so far. If I use Dig, it just gives it a chance to set up double team, and that could snowball out of control if I miss one, so I put my faith in Onion to come up with a big hit from Magnitude and just take Raichu down right away. And Onion promptly fails me completely, landing a Magnitude 4. To make matters worse, we don't take another quick attack, so I have to switch out. I bring in Sombrero, but see the double team I really didn't want to see. Then I get paralyzed by Thunder Wave. Shedskin cures the paralysis, but Dig misses and he goes for another double team. Sombrero lands the second Dig, but Surge has a super potion ready. It's officially spooky season. The potion puts him back out of range for the Dig KO and he gets a third double team off. Now I'm paralyzed again, and Shockwave is just hitting me too hard. I decide the play is to bring in Gloom as it can take Shockwaves better than Arbok. I need to hit an attack though. Shockwave is doing about 10 damage at a time, so we've got 6 chances. On the third try, Panda clutches up and gets it done. Now heading east from Cerulean, we have a route where every encounter would be Dupes Claws, so we have to skip that one. 10 would be the same, except it adds Voltorb to the encounter table, so we happily scoop one up and name him Oli. Newt the Geodude joins us in Rock Tunnel, which we aimlessly wander about until we somehow find our way to the exit. There's a few more encounters to get to before taking on Erica. Just as I'm about to get to our Route 8 encounter, Onion provides a thrilling encore to its Lieutenant Surge fight by hitting this trainer's Clefairy with back-to-back -back magnitude 4 hits. Are you kidding me? If you care, a that's road. a 1 in 400 chance of happening. No. I'm super excited when Growlithe pops up on Route 8 because Arcanine is just really cool. But my excitement quickly fades when it uses Roar and chases me out of the battle. I had Oli with Soundproof available to me too, it just completely slipped my mind. But for the second time, Redemption is right around the corner, as Growlithe is also the only option available to me on Route 7. It actually takes quite a while to find one, but it does show up, 
and this time I've prepared by sending Oli out. It doesn't even matter though, because it gets captured in the first ball I throw. I name this one Harvey. I don't envision Erica's team being able to do much of anything to a goal bat, so we head into the gym with the intent to sweep with Bread the goal bat. Pidgeotto and Harvey are available as backup if things go south, but things do not go south. Bread gets paralyzed against Victory Bell and misses one attack, but that's the only hurdle, as it goes through each of Erica's Pokemon in two hits apiece from there. We snag the Rainbow Badge and the Giga Drain TM, which could definitely be a useful move at some point, and we move on to the Rocket Hideout. Initially, this Giovanni battle appears to pose no threat to us thanks to the rock ground typing of Onyx and Rhyhorn. Shiggy completely destroys them with water moves, but Kangaskhan is a bit of a different matter. It hits Primeape with a Tail Whip on the switch, and I slightly overestimate my ability to take a hit. It turns out Stab Mega Punch hurts a lot. A critical hit here would have taken James out, but fortunately, it's not a critical hit, so we only take about two thirds of our health and damage. From here I know I outspeed and I can safely stay in and finish Kangaskhan off, but that was scary. Our rival awaits us in Pokemon Tower mourning his Raticate. Little does he know he got his own form of revenge this time around as he killed our Fero in the same battle. He issues a challenge and although his team is starting to take shape here, the fight occurs at a weird stage in the game and because of the level caps we're actually pretty over leveled. A single spark from Oli takes out Pidgeotto, and then for some reason Kaz sends out Gyarados against an electric type, so Oli takes him down too. At this point Oli's cooking, so instead of switching I just let him take down Growlithe. I switch in Gyarados and wipe out Kadabra with a bite, then take out Ivysaur with two Dragon Rages, shrugging off a critical hit Razor Leaf in between hits. Now we can continue up the tower. We catch a Ghastly named Spoopy and proceed to the top of the Pokemon Tower with little interruption saving Mr. Fuji and taking his flute as our payment. Now that we can get past the Snorlaxes, we can also head to Fuchsia City, but we're at a bit of an awkward point in the game. Koga and Sabrina share the same level cap of 43. There's a chance the Pokemon I bring into the Koga fight at level 43 will end up over the level cap for Sabrina, so I need to craft my team carefully. As I look over my encounters though, an answer becomes clear. The Ghastly that we caught in Pokemon Tower is perfect for Koga. Koga's Pokemon have the following movesets. His Coughings have Sludge, Self-Destruct, Toxic, and Smokescreen. His Weezing has the same moveset but Tackle instead of Self-Destruct. And his Muck has Sludge, Toxic, Acid Armor, and Minimize. While it's entirely possible for Koga to annoy the heck out of us with Smokescreen and Minimize shenanigans, that's about all he'll be able to manage. Haunter's Typing renders it unaffected by Toxic, immune to Self-Destruct and Tackle, and resistant to Sludge. Also. Haunter learns Psychic via the TM we picked up in Saffron City. It also learns Shadow Ball, a move that never misses, so that counters the Minimize Smokescreen plays, although it's significantly weaker than a super effective Psychic would be. I won't be bringing Haunter to the Sabrina fight either. It's kinda tempting, but it's very frail and weak to Psychic, which feels very risky to bring against Kadabra and Alakazam. So, safe to bring Haunter up to the level cap and then leave it in the box for a while, it seems we have a plan. I also bring Newt, now a Graveler, along just in case I have to switch out to reset the accuracy drops. It has a quad resistance to poison and a resistance to normal plus a great defense stat, so it should be able to take plenty of hits. It turns out that I've completely underestimated Haunter though, I didn't even need the backup. Maybe it's just the poor special defense of the Weezing line, but Haunter completely rips through Koga's team. One Psychic takes down his first coughing, bringing in Muck, and we do almost three quarters of Muck's health in a single blow, which is way more than I expected. He goes for Acid Armor, and we take him out with another Psychic. Another one hit KO on coughing brings up Weezing, and Haunter one-shots that too. Dang, you go, Spoopy! I'll have to put a few Pokemon away now to avoid exceeding the level cap, but I've also got three pretty big fights in a row. The Silco rival fight, Giovanni, and then Sabrina. Sabrina's team is completely terrifying with how hard Kadabra and Alakazam can hit, so my strategy is to find Pokemon that either have dark type moves or hit physically while having very good special bulk. Hopefully we can take her Pokemon down in one or two hits without being at too much risk of dying to her powerful psychic moves. That means I need to keep Pokemon like Gyarados and Blastoise down a few levels for the rival and Giovanni fights, because I'll need them for Sabrina. 
Primeape is surely going to come for Giovanni's Kangaskhan, and we craft a team of Electrode for Pidgeot and Gyarados, Blastoise and Gyarados for Growlithe and Alakazam, Pidgeot and Golbat for Venusaur. Water types should surely handle Giovanni's team pretty well, too. The formula I've developed for the rival fight works like a charm. Cass has brought a much stronger team to this battle that can definitely make us pay for any mistakes, but only takes Pidgeot down with a pair of sparks and then one-shots Gyarados as Kaz sent his water dragon straight into danger for the second fight in a row. I bring out Speedy for Growlithe and surf it away, staying in on Alakazam as he sets up Calm Mind. After one Calm Mind, Dragon Rage becomes the preferred option to surf as his special defense is boosted, but Alakazam survives on a sliver of health and uses Recover. I Dragon Rage again as he goes for Future Sight, then Dragon Rage a third time to finally bring it down. I switch to our Venusaur counter, Bread, but it gets put to sleep on the switch and then it has to take the Future Sight hit. Fortunately, Venusaur's strongest move is Razor Leaf, and we eat those. Eventually, Bread wakes up and brings Venusaur down with a pair of wing attacks, so we can move on to Giovanni. Although, not before a thankful self employee gives us a Lapras. We don't have any other Saffron City encounters, as we didn't pick up Hitmonchan or Hitmonlee, so we'll take it. We name it Chester. Giovanni is clearly really happy to see us, and we get into a fight, but I'm pretty confident in our bulky water types to handle it. Outside of taking a stray body slam from Nita Queen, Blastoise handles the first two Pokemon pretty well. And I switch in Gyarados on Kangaskhan for the Intimidate with the intention of making it safe for Primeape to switch in. But Giovanni lands a critical hit Mega Punch on Speedy, and did I ever tell you that Stab Mega Punch hurts? With crits ignoring the stat drop from Intimidate, I realize we're probably just gonna have to dodge the crit and switch Primeape in. Giovanni, brilliant as he is, goes for Rage. I miss a cross chop, but take a non crit mega punch pretty well, then land a cross chop. Shiggy comes back out to deal with Rhyhorn, and Giovanni flees the building. So, the Lapras we just got actually really helps the Sabrina plan because it's so bulky and also has a very strong physical attack and body slam. I'm reasonably confident in its ability to take a hit from her heavy hitters and retaliate with a body slam that takes them out in one shot. In fact, we don't even have to take a hit from Kadabra because she goes for Calm Mind. Thanks to a crit, Ice Beam takes Mr. Mime out in one hit too. Venomoth survives a hit, but just misses a supersonic, so we finish it off. Now it's just Alakazam left. Although I'm reasonably confident in the one shot with Body Slam, I don't know how much damage it does with Psychic, so I play to ensure the win and go for Parish Song. We take a Psychic that doesn't actually do very much damage at all, and so a single Body Slam finishes the fight. Something wonderful happens as Shiggy, the not-so-aptly-named Blastoise, reaches level 42. It learns Rain Dance. At this point, the final two gym leaders are an absolute breeze. If you've seen my Squirtle Squad challenge video, a Rain Dance and Surf strategy lets me sweep the last two gyms with a single Squirtle. This time we've got a Blastoise. The two gym fights here couldn't possibly be more free. We take on Blaine, but honestly there isn't even much of a fight here. We set up Rain Dance on Growlithe and immediately proceed to sweep his entire team with four surfs. Blastoise takes eight damage in the entire battle. With the lack of diversity on his team and the sheer abundance of water type Pokemon available, Blaine has to be one of the easiest fights in a hardcore Nuzlocke of this game. As we prep to fight Giovanni, our poor Bread is trying his best to evolve, but unfortunately he just can't seem to do it. Come on game, he's trying his best over here. Poor Bread. I figure much the same strategy I used on Blaine will work on Giovanni, so I just set up Rain Dance on Rhyhorn and wash it away with Surf. Same thing works on Dugtrio, although it does outspeed us and hit with Earthquake. Nita Queen outspeeds us too, and it also lands an Earthquake. It goes down to a Surf, but having seen Nita Queen outspeed me, I get a little worried about Nita King. I know its attack is higher than Nita Queen's, and Nita Queen did 34 damage with Earthquake. I don't think it's entirely out of the realm of possibility that a critical hit EQ from Nido King takes me out, so I switch into Speedy to finish the fight off. One Surf on each of his last two Pokemon allows us to complete our collection of badges. To be honest, the gym leader fights to this point have all been pretty much trivial. Part of that is having the right encounters, and I think maybe part of it has also been putting a little bit of effort into preparing for each fight instead of just charging in but I do think it's gone a lot more smoothly than I originally anticipated. However, we are approaching the hardest part of the game, and I eagerly await the test in front of me.
Before we get to the rival fight, Victory Road and Elite Four, we do have several encounters left to tidy up. I don't know if it's officially illegal to use the static encounters, like the legendary birds or Snorlax in a hardcore Nuzlocke. I think it is, but I'm not sure. It feels too strong to me either way, so I didn't catch any of them. There's a few other encounters I decide to skip because I can't imagine getting a Pokemon I'd use on the Elite Four team anyway, but a few I decide to go grab just in case. We catch Squishy the Tentacool and Dunny the Horsey on the water routes, and then we make for the power plant where we welcome Oni the Pikachu to the team. Pikachu is definitely the biggest addition to the squad, I've wanted one for the entire game. We evolve Harvey into Arcanine, Panda into Vileplume, and Oni into Raichu, and get ready to go. Our rival challenges us on the way to the Indigo Plateau. Oli starts the battle off right by landing a critical hit spark into Pidgeot, though our rival has gotten smarter this time, and so he sends in Rhyhorn instead of Gyarados next. I switch to Shiggy and KO it with Surf, so the rival sends out Venusaur. I go into Crobat, use Wing Attack, and we score another critical hit. That brings in Alakazam. I somewhat nervously switch Shiggy back in, but Alakazam went for Disable, so there was nothing to worry about. It starts to set up Calm Minds as I hit it with a Surf. The boost to special stats is scary, but we're fortunate. The rival keeps wanting to use Disable. He uses it again while I set up Rain and finish off Alakazam. He only has Growlithe and Gyarados left. Growlithe goes down easy to a Surf, but because of the Rain I set up myself, Gyarados is a problem. I know that Oli and Oni would both outspeed and knock him out in one hit if I can get either one of them in, but I don't think it's safe to do so. In retrospect, I think the play here is probably to protect to stall a turn of rain, then go into Gyarados or something to eat a hit in the last turn of the rain, and then go into one of my electric types. In the moment that's not what I do, I do something far riskier and switch in Oli right away. He goes for Hydro Pump, and it misses. There's no way Oli survives this hit if it lands, but he lives, and we land a spark to seal the deal. With a quick jaunt through Victory Road, the true test of the hardcore Nuzlocke is now upon me, the Elite Four. Picking the right six Pokémon is important here. We don't just need to cover each fight, we need to have backup plans or else know which Pokémon absolutely cannot be put in any sort of danger. I spend some time going over all of my encounters and end up picking the following six Pokémon. Gyarados. It's probably our best Pokémon overall, especially having learned Earthquake via the TM from Giovanni's Gym. It destroys Bruno, handles itself pretty well against Lorelei, and is just overall very useful, especially with Intimidate. Lapras. I need something to deal with Lance's Dragons, and it natively learns Ice Beam, plus it's Stab Ice Beam. Lapras is incredibly bulky, Surf's really strong too, and Arch Song can be a pretty handy way to deal with an opponent's ace if we find ourselves in a sticky situation. Raichu. Pretty safe bet to handle most of Lorelei's team, and also very important for the couple of Gyarados we see later on, with Lance and the Champion. I think Raichu can set up Light Screen against Lorelei's Cloister too, anticipating it will go for a turn 1 Protect, which gives us a lot of safety if we have to switch out later in the battle. Arcanine. Intimidate, Stab Flamethrower, Strong Priority and Extreme Speed, and overall great stats. It's also a hard counter to the Champion's Venusaur. We have another one of those in Golbat, but Arcanine just has way more potential use in other battles. Haunter. Agatha's team feels somewhat similar to Koga's in that it's entirely poison type, and she likes to carry statuses, double team, stuff like that. Haunter isn't completely safe here like against Koga, especially with its frailty, but I think it can put in a lot of work with Psychic. For the last spot, Electrode seems like an option. It offers some redundancy in case something happens to Raichu. We need electric moves available for the two Gyarados in the last two fights. It has a bit of a weak moveset though. I give a little bit of thought to bringing Golbat, but its only purpose would be a Venusaur counter, and I think keeping Arcanine safe is pretty doable. So, eventually, I settle on Blastoise. It's weird because it gives me three water types, but they're all very bulky and none of the Elite Four members really threaten water types. There's not a single damaging electric or grass type move in any of their movesets until the champion. Plus, rain boosted surfs hit nearly everything hard. This is the squad. Before I step in to fight Lorelei, I decide to use Agatha's ace as the level cap instead of Lance. The standard is usually to use the final Elite Four member's ace, but to me, 
Level 60 seems to trivialize the first two battles a bit too much. I think I can do it at level 58 anyway. With that out of the way, I'm ready. My Pokemon are ready, so let's do this. Our lead Raichu almost takes Dugong out in one Thunderbolt, and we get full paralysis out of it right away, so Lorelei uses a full restore. Doesn't matter, we have speed and bring it down anyway. I know that Cloyster knows Protect, and the AI almost always goes for it here, so I take the opportunity to set up a light screen, and it works. Then we take it out with a Thunderbolt. To my surprise, even the specially defensive Slowbro goes down to one Thunderbolt. The streak of good luck continues now, as Lorelei sends in Lapras to get hit by a Thunderbolt. We hit the 10% Paralysis chance, and we get full Para. That allows us to take Lapras down on the next turn without incident. All that's left is Lorelei's Jinx. I don't know if Raichu is the Pokemon to use here, so I set up a screen to make extra sure the switch is safe. Then bring in Arcanine and take her out with a few flamethrowers. For Bruno, I lead with Gyarados and start by using Dragon Dance. I expect Rock Tomb from Onix, but it's an Onix and it's been intimidated, so it's not gonna do much damage. I'm right. It negates the speed boost from Dragon Dance, but so what? I think I get scared here of the possible damage a crit might do, so I just surf to KO Onyx, but then revert back to Dragon Dance against Hitmonchan. I'm pretty sure I need to be at more than plus one to sweep. I should have just kept Dragon Dancing against Onyx, but I get set up against Hitmonchan without taking much damage, and I proceed to wipe the rest of Bruno's team with Earthquakes. The first two fights of the Elite Four are down without providing any more threat to us than a Gym Leader. But that's all about to change. Oh boy, is that about to change. My Pokemon of choice for Agatha is Haunter because a lot of her moves don't threaten me too much, and we have a very powerful Psychic that hits her whole team super effectively. I know Haunter is frail, but I think I get a lot of one-hit KOs, and I also think Gengar's attack is low enough that if it does hit me, Haunter can take one. As you can see here though, Haunter cannot take one. We need to figure out a new plan. I send out Shiggy and set up Rain as she heals, then she double teams and Shiggy misses a Surf. She double teams again. Surf hits, but she just barely hangs on. Fortunately, we do hit Surf again to finish Gengar off, but we get no reprieve here as Golbat also outspeeds us and leaves Shiggy badly poisoned with the Poison Fang. It just barely survives a hit, so I leave Shiggy in to set up new rain. That will hopefully help Lapras with the rest of the fight, but I can't stay in another turn. Lapras cleans up Golbat, then takes Arbok down with two surfs, but Agatha's second Gengar is a menace. She puts Chester to sleep, then deals massive damage with a sludge bomb and I have to switch out. She puts Speedy to sleep too though, and then lands a critical hit sludge bomb that leaves Speedy on low health. Can't risk staying in while asleep, I have to switch to Arcanine. You'd think with two Intimidates on a Pokemon with an already bad attack stat that she wouldn't be doing too much damage, but she lands a second straight crit, so it doesn't matter. Now Harvey's in danger too. Finally get a hit off on her, but then I get put to sleep. I have to go out to my only non-status Pokemon, Oni. He goes for Nightmare on the switch, which doesn't work because Oni's awake, thankfully. Then I outspeed and KO with Thunderbolt. One Thunderbolt doesn't take down Haunter with one shot, so Oni too gets sent to an early nap time. Stay in as Agatha heals up with a full restore, but this time Oni wakes up quickly and hits a critical hit Thunderbolt that brings Haunter down. I know Agatha packs Dream Eater on that Haunter, and if Oni didn't wake up there, it legitimately could have been the end of the run. However, we're moving on. The current hero of the run, Oni, stays in the lead for Lance and makes short work of his Gyarados, bringing us to a section of the fight that Lapras shouldn't have much trouble with. That being said, Lapras is kind of slow and I don't want it taking a ton of unnecessary hits, so instead I go into Gyarados to take some pressure off. Dragonair hits fairly hard with Outrage, but after a Dragon Dance and a couple of Earthquakes it goes down. It did enough damage to me that I need to take Gyarados out though. Slight problem, Aerodactyl has a super effective stab move in Ancient Power, so I can't risk Lapras taking two of those hits. I have to go into Blastoise instead. I set up some rain for later just in case, and take Aerodactyl down with a Surf. With Lapras's job now much easier, Chester comes back in. 
He gets paralyzed, but takes down the two remaining dragons with ice beams, and a safety perish song just before knocking out Dragonite just in case. Only one fight separates me from a completed run now, and it promises to be the toughest. Our rival Kaz brings a strong, balanced team, and we only have a team of five left. The battle opens up with Oni landing a thunderbolt that gets Pidgeot down within a sliver of fainting. It gets healed off, but I have a solution in mind. I can't chance the thunder. I can't risk the thunder. Maybe we'll just high roll the thunderbolt instead. We did! We just high rolled the thunderbolt! It's that easy. With that, Pidgeot goes down. Speedy comes in to battle Rhyhorn as it's probably going to use Earthquake so we get a free switch, and Surf brings it down. Kaz goes out to Alakazam, I stay in, and fire off another Earthquake. We actually take Alakazam's hit really well, so while our rival uses another full restore, we stay in and finish him off. Kaz sends out Gyarados, so now I need to figure out how to safely get into Raichu. Speedy is low on health, and she's already done her job, so it seems like the least risky play is to let her go down and get the free switch. I feel really bad about letting a Mon go down on purpose, but it just seems like the smart play. Thank you for everything, Speedy. Oni's able to come in and take Gyarados down with the Thunderbolt. For Kaz's Arcanine, I switch into Blastoise and set up Rain Dance. He lands a critical hit E-Speed that brings Blastoise down really low on health. It's very close to a kill if I stay in, but I have to give it a shot. Shiggy lives on 6. We take Arcanine down with a Surf. It's down to just Minasaur, who starts charging Solar Beam in the rain as I bring Harvey in. Because of the rain, Aerial Ace is actually a little bit better here than Flamethrower. After a couple turns, Kaz eventually plays himself by going for Sunny Day. Not that he had anything to handle an Arcanine with anyway. With one last stream of fire, Harvey takes down Venusaur and sends our team into the Hall of Fame. So my first attempted Hardcore Nuzlocke run ever ends with three deaths and a completed run. With the run complete, I can honestly say I had a lot of fun with this. The Agatha fight was terrifying and the mistake of bringing Haunter really almost cost me the run. The prep for the other fights generally made them go smoothly, but I enjoyed having to actually come with a plan and then adapt in certain situations. It was definitely more enjoyable playing a hardcore Nuzlocke than just a regular Nuzlocke, and I'm happy I was able to finish the run on my first attempt. It definitely won't be the last time I do one of these. Let me know in the comments what game you might want to see next. If you enjoyed, please consider leaving a like on the video and checking out some of the other videos on the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.